much. I'm so excited to be here and a part of your seventh annual graduate education symposium. Why is she so hostile? <laughs> Why is she so hostile? Those were the words that I heard. So I'm going to ask you to just sort of hang with me for the next 20, 30 minutes or so. And, you know, Mary Hope and I were having a conversation last night about the difference between dialogue and communication. Dialogue is this great buzzword that Pax likes to use. But if you can just kind of focus on communication, where we just maybe understanding each other, you try to understand me, not necessarily worry about agreeing with what I say, and we can talk a little bit later about how I got to this space where people would dare ask, why is she so hostile? Let me give you a little bit of the context. I happen to be in Toledo, Ohio, at the University of Toledo. I was speaking on my recently published book, Crimes Against Humanity in the Land of the Free, Can a Truth and Reconciliation Process, Heal Racial Conflict in America. And I was speaking at the Institute of Peace Education, the International Institute of Peace Education, which was being hosted by the University of Toledo at the time. This is in July of 2015. And it was at the height of the Ferguson protests against the police killing of Michael Brown. So my audience is a group of Peace Ed scholars. And I'm speaking on this topic. And I'm pouring my heart out to them literally by saying how this killing of uh, this young man in this city or this young man in this city or the imprisonment of this woman who ended up quote unquote hanging herself in this city ended up breaking my heart and then we open for a Q&A and one of the participants raises her hands and she's a woman from Chile once again a peace ed scholar and she says something to this effect she says instead of asking a question she suggests that maybe African Americans might want to try utilizing some of the dialogue-centered peace-building measures rather than protests to address police killings. So I took a deep breath, didn't respond, and in that moment that I'm taking a deep breath, a male, a black male from Nigeria, raises his hand and he sort of chimes in and adds on and says that certainly more could be accomplished by African Americans through peaceful means rather, through, rather than through marches and protests and demonstrations. And so, you know, once again, I breathe deeply, and I'm thinking they have not understood me. You know, you may not always agree, but they didn't even understand the pain that I was feeling. And so before I even responded to them, I made sure that I said these four words, with all due respect. <laughs> I said, with all due respect to him and with all due respect to her. I wanted to make it clear that it was with all due respect. And then I said, do you even know the history of my people in this nation? Do you know the centuries of pain that we've been through? And you dare to criticize what are peaceful protests as an exertion of our pain, as a way to let the world know how much pain we're going through? So I may have been perceived as hostile in that moment, but there was one woman that came up to me at the end of the presentation. And I didn't get her name, I wish I had, but she stood there, she shook my hand, she looked me in the eye, and she said, I hear you. She said, I hear you. And that's what I'm going to ask you all to do this afternoon. Just hear me, please, before you begin to judge where I'm coming from. Because at the root of that hostility was just pain. It was just pain, and it was just hurt. And we'll talk more about that later. But when Pushpa invited me to come and talk with you this afternoon, and I read the description of the program, I was like, oh, that's a no-brainer. She wants me to talk about cultural diversity, impacts, and I can do that. I happen to be writing a chapter on the infusion of cultural diversity in global curricula as a peace-building measure. It's being proposed by the United Nations Education, by, by UNESCO. And so I'm like, you know, I can do that. It's not a problem. But then when we talk, she said, no, that's not really what I want you to talk about. She said, I want you to talk about social justice, and I want you to talk about racial conflict, and I want you to talk about where PACS is in this era of Black Lives Matter. What is the role of PACS? What is the collective position that we have as scholars and proponents of PACS in this era where we see the resurgence, continual resurgence, of racial conflict and racial terrorism here in the United States of America. So that's where we'll, we're going to go this afternoon. And this is not to say that this is a priority issue over all of the other 
violent, very violent conflict issues going on in our world today, because certainly there are numerous, but this is the one we're going to focus on. So the title of my talk is Walking on Eggshells, Exploring the Causes and Consequences of Pax Timidity in Addressing Social Injustices Related to Race and Power in the United States. And hopefully after this presentation, we'll all be able to take a close and unabashed look at the choices, opportunities, and responsibilities I believe that PAX has. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I would love, because this is my area, can I record this for my own personal It is being recorded. It is, thank you. That's all I need to okay. know, because I want to say this, so thank you. Okay. It's okay. So I'm asking that we all take an unabashed look at the choices, opportunities, and I believe responsibilities that PAX has as a privileged area of study to impact the causes of peace and conflict resolution for all and not just for a favored few and not just for those so-called third world countries who we know have all those problems with conflict and they're wrapped with interstate violence which is really a consequence and a default of the colonialist project. In other words, in my opinion, Pax has benignly neglected opportunities to critique all socially oppressive processes and structures. It has neglected to support the emancipation of all who are oppressed, and it has neglected to develop a critical consciousness among all. Instead, Pax has chosen to target on issues that I see as addressing mainstream conflict issues, involving Anglo-Saxons, involving the dominant culture in our, in our, I guess in our country, because we're focusing mostly on the United States here. And it is also focused on those non-US located class and religious conflicts that are in Central Europe. And then again, it is also focused on setting straight those countries in Asia and Africa and South America. And when I say it's focusing on mainstream conflict issues, I mean issues like school violence, you know, issues like bullying, but we're not really addressing issues like the school to prison pipeline that impact my community. We're not addressing the persistent economic disparities that impact my community. And we're not addressing these issues that have plagued my ancestors and continue to plague their descendants and that have been going on for it seems ever in this country. I get that Pax originated as a Western-centric philosophy, but I do believe that most would agree that peace and conflict studies is uniquely positioned to be an interdisciplinary powerhouse if it so chooses. We have educators and practitioners, state and non-state actors who support Pax across a broad spectrum of specialties from anthropology to law to communication, psychology, sociology, and these PACS proponents have an opportunity to do what Paulo Freire might call to, to become conduits of change or to become instigators of emancipatory action. But I'm not sure that that's who PACS wants to be. I'm not really sure that PACS knows who it wants to be. And to be honest with you, for a long time, I felt a disconnect between PACS and between my concerns, the concerns that really impact my heart and my spirit. I will tell you that when I first began to study conflict analysis and resolution, I was so excited because I felt like, you know, I have an opportunity to be a voice for African Americans that I felt were not being heard. And I remember the first article that I had published was in the University of Virginia's Journal of Mind and Human Interaction. Uh, Dr. Vamik Volkan was the editor at that time. I don't know if he still is or not. But I was excited because I thought I get to focus on what I call the granddaddy of all, all conflicts. This granddaddy's been living for 400 years in this country. He's still living in this country. And the article was entitled, A Perennial Morning, Identity Conflict and the Transgenerational Transmission of Trauma Within the African American Community. So once again, you know, I was so excited. And I'm thinking, this is just the start. You know, I'm going to have a voice. People will be listening. And so I did a lot of research next on an article that I was excited about. It was called Identity Conflict, the Root of Anger in African American Women. I submitted that article to so many journals. It was rejected from so many journals. My hopes were, you know, slightly deflated, but I'm like, you know, I'm still going to believe in this passion that I so feel and trying to draw attention to this area that I think needs attention. 
And so I was invited by my department chair at Nova Southeastern University at that time to hold a panel discussion where we invited the public and we invited scholars in DCAR and my cohorts to discuss racial conflict in America and to discuss the transgenerational transmission of trauma in African Americans. Now I will tell you, I don't remember much about that day. I don't remember much about what we discussed on that panel. But I do remember leaving with my head hung down, and I am not exaggerating. At the end of that panel discussion, I felt so dejected. I felt so misunderstood. You see, I felt that the majority of people who should have been able to, my cohorts, you know, my colleagues in DCAR, they should have been able to embrace and maybe understand why we needed to have this discussion on race were really not open to having this discussion on race, and it kept getting deflected to other types of periphery subjects and other types of periphery topics. And I don't think anything was resolved that day, but I knew that I began to feel more and more this disconnect between PACS and my interests. And so I decided to do what I will call maybe the easy, it took the easy way out, I decided to start focusing on school violence. I did my dissertation on terrorism and survivors of September 11. I began to focus on police violence and had a chapter published in a book, but not on police violence in this country. It was on international police violence because I just felt that, you know, if I'm not going to be listened to here, maybe I need to go off and venture where everyone else is going. And then this young man was killed. And so my life changed. When Trayvon Martin was killed, my life changed. And I knew then I had to go back to trying to be a conduit of change and trying to be an instigator of emancipatory action for my people. This is when I began to work on the book, Crimes Against Humanity in the Land of the Free. And I just want to tell you a little bit about that experience. So I reached out to colleagues in DCAR. I reached out to former professors. And I reached out to strangers who were recommended to me, and I asked if they'd be interested in contributing to this book on a truth and reconciliation process in the United States. And I was so surprised when this man that I love so dearly, a former professor, and I had the deepest respect for him, and this is not an attack on him, and I'm not even going to say his name, but I reached out to him thinking surely I would get the support, and he sent this email to me, and I'm just going to read to you a sentence from it. And he said, my first thought is that a formal apology may be appropriate, but a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country might turn into a media circus or worse. And so it could be extremely counterproductive. It is usually used immediately after the end of hostilities in countries torn by civil strife or division. I wasn't expecting that response. And fortunately, I was in a place which, once again, after this young man was killed, where I no longer felt the dejection so easily, and I no longer let go of my desire and my interest so readily. So I said, well, you know, it might turn into a media circus, but I'm going to shoot for it anyway, and I'm going to try for it anyway. And when I die, at least this will be here. And somebody may say, you know what, a long time ago, this girl, you know, Imani Scott said, hey, why don't we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? You know, it may be 60 or 100 years from now, but maybe somebody will say, well, maybe she was onto something because I just refused to let it go. And so that's when I began to really put my effort into having this book done. And I remember reaching out to ACR. I was a member at the time, and I said, you know, hey, the book had just been published. Can I do a workshop or a panel discussion or something where we talk about this whole issue? And I got a letter back from them saying, why don't you hold a poster presentation? And I thought to myself, man, this is so beyond a poster presentation. But this is the kind of roller coaster that I have been accustomed to being on, right? wanting to deal with this issue. So I was delighted in September of 2016 when the United Nations came out with a statement against basically condemning the United States for what was going on. And basically what they said was that contemporary police killings and the trauma that they create are reminiscent of past racial terror and lynching, and in particular, the legacy of colonial history, enslavement, racial subordination, segregation, racial terrorism, and racial inequality in the United States remain a serious challenge. And they went on to suggest that it is a matter of urgency that this human rights crisis 
be recognized and be addressed in this country. But even with that, I will say that I have seen very little movement in PACs to address what the UN considered to be a human rights crisis as a matter of urgency. And so I'm saying that if the United Nations finally came out and said something about it, you know, PACs, can you hear me? ACR, you know, can you hear me? Racist hatred, fear, violence, and terrorism in this country have existed for hundreds of years. From Charleston, the shootings in Charleston, through Charlottesville, through the charlatan that I call him, in the White House, down the street, any refutation of a continually oppressive America for blacks is a lie. And I am talking about for African Americans whose history, whose heritage is my heritage. So that that black male in that meeting from Nigeria when he raised his hand, his experience is different than mine. So of course he cannot relate and he cannot connect. And so when PAX calls itself diverse with people of color, and those people don't have my historical heritage, there is always going to be this disconnect. Race is the true four-letter word, and that's why we prefer to use terms like people of color or cultural diversity. It sounds nicer. But race in this country is like a perpetual decay. It's like after chattel slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the United States had a root canal, but someone just came along and put a new crown on it, and so then the infection just spread and spread and spread and spread, and so now it's a cancer, and it's a cancer that still goes untreated. And I just want to read to you, because I, I sat down one day and I just listed everything to sort of put into context what it is that my people have been through, for those who don't know and those who can't relate to why I might feel so hostile sometimes, once again, but the root of that hostility is hurt and pain. The transatlantic slave trade, sustained domestic or chattel slavery, fugitive slave acts, black codes, convict leasing, peonage, Jim Crow, segregation, discrimination, widespread lynchings, medical experimentations, forced infertility, resistance to integration, domestic terrorism, environmental, institutional, and structural racism. The tendency of citizens today to revisit race-based intolerance, bigotry, bias, and the like should come as no surprise because it's never really been addressed in this country. All that stuff is just piled up and piled up. And Pax has for the most part been inaudible. This, as the politics of distraction continue to successfully lead us away from what is occurring in this country to focus on what's occurring in other countries. So yeah, my students and uh, my daughter, I hear them saying this thing, feel in some kind of way. You ever heard the kids say that? I'm feeling some kind of way. And I always tell my daughter, well, some kind of way is not necessarily a good kind of way, so we kind of debate it. <coughs> but I am feeling some kind of way. I'm angry at a government that allows my people to be hunted and killed by rabid police officers after having gone through so much drama, we still have to deal with this type of trauma. I am troubled by the structure that allows two white men who recently killed prison guards in Georgia to live, but it deems it justifiable to kill a black kid for playing with a toy gun. I lash out at a system that thinks it's okay to let guilty officers go free because they say the five magic words, I feared for my life. So therefore you have an excuse to kill us. I am incensed by the sadistic notion that my brown skin makes me less deserving and less vital and less human than someone with white skin. I don't get that. I fight against a justice system which deems it acceptable to bring Burger King to a white kid who just killed nine people worshiping God in the church, and yet they would shoot this man dead in front of his five-year-old child as he's reaching for his driver's license and it's not a problem. I'm confused by white Christians who heartlessly choose to ignore the blatant immorality of a system that targets my people for subjugation, demonization, and extermination while telling us to get over slavery 
while they still mourn and memorialize the death of Jesus from 2,000 years ago. But we're supposed to just get over it. I'm hurting because we've endured so much. We've endured more than enough. But we can't let our guards down. I'm anxious as I attempt to confront the wickedness of this nation's legalized inhumanity and reprobate treatment of its own citizens. And Pax, I am disheartened by this field that I used to believe in for its continual failure to address the granddaddy of all conflict, the elephant, the 400-year-old elephant that's sitting in the land of the free. And to be clear, it is only now because of technology that one of the most apparent vestiges of oppression in the modern history of the United States is police violence against blacks. But this has been going on forever. This has been going on. Police, the policing system in this country was founded as a result of slavery, as a consequence of slavery. In fact, the historical, institutional, and cultural arrangements of police violence in the United States has always been a state-sanctioned occurrence. And it's not any different from that occurring in Guatemala, in Chile, in South Africa, in Mexico, or in Brazil. Ultimately, however, police violence must be recognized as a manifestation of systemic racism. It really is a manifestation of systemic racism. Racism permeates everything in America. It permeates the air we breathe. It permeates the water we drink. It's everywhere. So in preparation for this presentation, I looked at the programs of some 40 different PACS uh, study areas that are located throughout the country at different universities. And I noticed that they describe programs using these types of phrases that PACS is about working together on projects that make a difference in the lives of vulnerable people. The PACS is dedicated to providing high quality professional training and multiple conflict intervention and prevention skills. The PACS explores issues related to peace and violence and social justice. But there's a disconnect, PACS, between what you do for others and what you do for my people. And it's linked to this disconnect period in this country. We are a microcosm, no doubt, of the larger system here of racism. So I came up with a short list of four reasons why I think this is happening. And this is what I want you to think about. And this is what I'm hoping that we'll kind of discuss in our breakouts after this presentation. Because I don't necessarily have questions to leave you with so much as I've got my ideas. But once again, you don't have to agree with them, but if you can maybe understand where I'm coming from. So four areas that I think are probably causes for this disconnect would be what I consider the dominated consciousness of Pax. I believe that Pax has been whitewashed in the spirit, once again, of Paulo Freire. Pax has been whitewashed by the thinking behind the very same colonialist project that continues to dominate our world. As a microcosm of the world, this should come as no surprise. However, as an area of study that prides itself in addressing the elimination of violence, this concerns me. And hopefully it will concern you. I also believe that Pax has been gaslighted into believing the rhetoric of American exceptionalism. It is very unfortunate, yet very clear, that crimes against humanity do happen in America, and they have been occurring here for centuries. In fact, I was having a conversation earlier with my colleague from Kennesaw and sharing with him, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Senate Resolution 26 and the House Resolution 194 that were issued in 2008 and 2009 where Congress literally apologized to Americans and issued resolutions committing to rectifying the crimes against humanity that have been committed in our country. But I will tell you, this, was, this happened actually right after the election of President Barack Obama, and nothing has ever been done about the resolutions or to move forward on them. PACS, like millions of other people throughout the world, has been gaslighted into believing that only those people in those third world countries actually need help. Only people in Afghanistan or Iraq or Nigeria. You know, they see those areas as conflict zones, but Rosewood in Florida was a conflict zone. Conflict zone. 
Greensboro was a conflict zone. Char Charlottesville, a conflict zone. But we haven't focused on those conflict zones. I also believe that PACS reflects those with cultural capital. Okay, the normalization of everything Euro, of everything Anglo-Saxon. So PACS will focus on bullying in schools, but it won't focus on bullying at traffic stops. PACS will focus on nation building in Somalia, but it won't focus on community building in St. Louis. PACS will focus on gun violence in Las Vegas, but it won't focus on the proliferation of guns in inner city Chicago. This last one, I don't even have an answer or a question. I mean, I'm just wondering if we're not equipped to handle the granddaddy of all conflicts. Maybe that's why we avoid it. Maybe we know that there's no win-win here, and so we just say, we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. But there are consequences. Of course, the struggle continues. From slavery in the 1600s to the school-to-prison pipeline in the 21st century, from the Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s to Central Park Five in the 1980s, from Emmett Till in 1955 to Trayvon Martin in 2012, from the racist, from, sorry, from the race fist of Tommy Smith in 1968 to the bended knee of Colin Kaepernick, the protests continue. Nothing has really changed. And then I think another consequence is silence is violence. Silence perpetuates violence, and as long as we are silent, we are contributing to the violence. We are partakers of the violence, in my view. I think that perhaps we have to acknowledge that white privilege does exist, and we cannot remain silent about it. And we must actively work to challenge this tendency to just focus on mainstream conflicts, and once again, embrace all conflicts, even the difficult ones, even those that make us feel uncomfortable. Pushpa suggested to me that when I sent her the title for this talk, she said it was long. She said, but it had the word race in it. And she said some wanted the word race taken out. They wanted it replaced with ethnicity or cultural diversity. We've got to get past that. If we truly are who we say we are, if not, then our integrity becomes suspect. You know, my daughter got her graduate degree in conflict analysis and resolution at Kennesaw State University. She wanted to do that because she knew I got my doctorate degree in the same field. And there was a part of me that wanted to say to her, you know, baby, it's not what it really says it is. But she's a lawyer, and so she told me that she does get to use some of the skills and the interventions in law. So that works for her in law, but beyond that, she hasn't really been able to apply any of the concepts to our life experiences as African Americans. You know, when I think about this whole idea of integrity, it's a big deal to me because integrity is, as you probably know, it's are you who you say you are? It's are you the same on the inside that you appear to be on the outside? And that's what I want to know about PAX. When we say that we address social justice, do we really address it for all? And then I think that there have been so many lost opportunities because I believe that we have had an opportunity to impact the lives of the vulnerable people in this nation, of the sick, of the poor, of the undereducated, of the uneducated, of the underunemployed, and the, un the unemployed in my community, and we have not done that. You guys are familiar with the book Two Nations? No, no. Okay, so uh, the book Two Nations is um, Andrew Hacker. And I just want to read to you this little thing as I begin to close. I use that book in my intercultural communication skills class. And there's a scenario that I read to my students. So the book is basically Two Nations, Black and White, Hostile, Still Hostile. And in the book, he gives this scenario. So he actually reads this to his students and he asks them what do they think. It's called The Visit. He tells his student, you will be visited tonight by an official you've never met. He begins by telling you that he's quite embarrassed. The organization he represents has made a mistake, something that hardly ever happens. According to their records, he tells you that you were supposed to be born black to another set of parents far from where you were raised. However, 
The official rules being what they are, this error must be rectified as soon as possible. So at midnight tonight, all of you who are white, you'll become black. And this will mean not simply darker skin, but the bodily and facial features associated with African ancestry. However, inside, you will be the person you always were. Your knowledge and ideas will remain intact, but outwardly, you will not be recognizable to anyone you know. Your visitor emphasizes that being born to the wrong parents was in no way your fault. Accordingly, his organization is prepared to offer you some reasonable recompense. Would you, he asks, care to name a sum of money that you might consider appropriate since you're going to have to live the rest of your life as a black person? And he says that, you know, this does not mean that you necessarily have to be poor and that his group, that his organization does have money and that it can be quite generous when it wants to be. And he finishes by saying that their records also show that you're scheduled to live as a black person for the next 60 years. So if you have to live for the next black, as a black person for the next 60 years, what can we offer you? At the end of the parable, he has this discussion with his students, and he says, when this parable has been put to white students, most seem to feel that it would not be out of place to ask for one million dollars for each year they would be living as a black American. In other words, if they have to become black, they want sixty million dollars. Now, I like this story because it tells me that in our hearts, in our minds, we know that skin color means different treatment. It means you might get terrorized by the police, you know. It means you might not get that job. It means that if you are an elementary school kid and your skin color is brown, that you will likely be expelled or suspended at four times the rate than someone who has white skin. It means all of these things. Racism is real and it is immoral. And I am asking you, do you hear me? Because if you hear me, can you do anything to help change this? Can you maybe begin to steer your students to study in this area? It's not all about what's happening outside of the United States. It's really for us whose ancestors come from here and whose children and grandchildren will be living here. It's about what's going on right here. And so that is my request. Thank you.